So I hope you can uh, hear me and... Uh, yes. Let's see. So then you should be able to see my slides, yeah? Yes. Okay. Yes. So then uh, uh, let me begin. So uh, I'd like to thank the, the organizers uh, for giving me the chance to speak at this conference. Um, so this is work that I've done uh, in collaboration with uh, Alessio Baldazzi, who's at CISA, and Ricardo Ben Ali Zinati, who's, uh, who's now in Paris and was uh, before a, a student at uh, CISA. So what we're doing is uh, we're proposing a new scheme for this method that's called the uh, non-perturbative renormalization group. Uh, it's also uh, uh, known as the exact renormalization group or the functional renormalization group, depending on what you want to uh, emphasize. So these are just three names for the same method. And uh, this method has applications in many areas of physics, including statistical physics, quantum many particle systems, high energy physics, and also uh, gravity. So actually I come from uh, applications in gravity, but since I've been at CISA, I have started to do some, uh, explore uh, some applications in statistical physics. Uh, so there is this very nice review that came out uh, in the summer, uh, which is on the archive. Um, so if you want to know more about uh, this, it really is a thorough review that talks about all the different uh, applications. Um, so this new scheme that we, uh, that we are uh, putting forward is actually a practical implementation of a much older idea, which has been advocated in the 70s by uh, Stephen Weinberg, uh, Giovanni uh, Joan Lozinho and Franz uh, Wegner. So there are some references here to these uh, old papers where they are putting forward uh, these ideas. Um, so uh, at its core, the idea is that uh, whenever we have problems in physics, they can usually be made simpler if we use a particular coordinate system or a frame of reference, and uh, we can transform there by making a, a change of variables. So we can make a certain choice of variables to, to express the problem. And the renormalization group itself is an embodiment of this idea where we want to make a change of variables in order to better describe physics that happens at, di at different length scales. So then an RG transformation basically gives us a new description at each, uh, at each uh, length scale. So usually what is done in this non-perturbative RG in what we'll call the, the standard scheme is to just make uh, simple uh, linear rescalings of the, of, uh, the fields. So I will be talking about uh, a field theory here. So this is where the field chi is rescaled and then you work in terms of uh, a field phi. And this, uh, this rescaling is where the word uh, renormalization comes from. So this is where the name comes from. But the, the idea that was advocated in the 70s, so this is really back when this non-perturbative renormalization group was first uh, uh, invented by, uh, by Wilson, uh, Weinberg and Jonas Zinio and Wegner were, also, were advocating that you could also make very much more general transformations, such as uh, non-linear ones and also ones where you have derivatives of the fields involved in, the, uh, in these transformations. And although, of course, if you make an arbitrary transformation of this type, you'll just make things much more complicated. The point is that you can make um, specific transformations and these can actually actually on really simplify the, the RG because what it means is when you make the RG step, you can choose these transformations so that actually only a subset of all your coupling constants, which are called the essential couplings, are actually becoming scale dependent. And there is these other couplings called the, the inessential couplings, which don't need to, to change under the transformation. So it actually simplifies uh, these renormalization group equations, which can uh, in general be very, very complicated. So this is the idea that we're pursuing. So the overview of my, the rest of my talk is that first of all, I will introduce uh, these sorts of transformations, which I will call frame transformations in a simple setting of a, of a classical field theory. So this is, this is classical in the sense that there is no, no fluctuations either of statistical or, or, or quantum nature. And then I will talk about these frame transformations uh, when we consider correlation functions for, uh, for uh, statistical field theory or quantum field theory. And this will, uh, this will then set up the, uh, the framework where I will uh, then uh, 
uh, where, where I would develop these ideas. And so then I will, will introduce this non-perturbative renormalization group uh, in, the, in the sort of standard scheme. And then I will tell you uh, how this can be generalized in this essential scheme. So I'll explain what our, what our new idea is. And then, um, and then I'll show you an application to the 3D easing model, uh, uh, in particular the critical, uh, the critical points, the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, and how these, uh, these ideas actually uh, can be used in practice. Um, so to get started, I just want to consider, uh, uh, so in this talk, I will just consider a real scalar field in D dimensions or simplicity, but everything can be, uh, can be uh, generalized to, to, to different, uh, different cases. So more fields, fermionic fields, uh, and uh, situations where you might lose certain uh, symmetries. So I will take for granted here, uh, translational invariance and uh, and also Z2 uh, uh, invariance. So if I make chi go to minus chi, then the equations will be uh, symmetric. Uh, so if we just consider some classical field theory or even a cla some, some classical model then described by uh, an action, and then we have some Lagrangian density, then at the classical level, we just want to uh, solve the equations of motion, which are obtained by uh, uh, minimizing the action. But in the original variable chi, the equations of motion could be quite complicated, and it might be that we can move to a different variable uh, phi to simplify the, the equations of motion. And uh, the equations of motion, then the action can get transformed then into, into an action, which is then depends on the field phi, uh, which should then be some function of the, of the original fields. So. So where I use the square brackets, that, that normally means that it's not just a function of the field, but also the derivatives of the field. So it's a function of, of, of whatever is in the, the square brackets. Uh, and what we can think about this more generally is that this, this, uh, this uh, change of variables can be thought of as a deformorphism or a change of coordinates on configuration space. So we can think of chi as just some coordinates on, on uh, configuration space. And then what we're doing is we're we're choosing to use a different, uh, a different coordinate system on configuration space. And uh, for then the equations of motions to, to be equivalent, we need that this map is a proper deformorphism, which means that it should be suitably differentiable and that it should have an inverse. Um, so then I can give an example, which I will actually come back to in uh, when, when we talk about the easing model, which is if I imagine I have a classical theory which has an action which uh, de uh, depends on actually two derivatives of the field, and it depends on these two uh, independent functions of the field, so a potential and then a function z that multiplies the two derivative term. And then we could ask, well, is there a transformation I can do to get rid of this uh, one of these functions, so to get rid of the function z in particular? And uh, one can easily check then that there is a transformation where this, where the potential would transform uh, as a as a as a scalar, if you like, under this transformation. And uh, in order to get rid of the factor of z, then you then you have to have the, the first derivative of chi uh, as respect uh, as uh, expressed in terms of phi, just as a function. So this derivative is the inverse of this of, of z uh, to the one half. And then you have this, this, this inverse transformation. So as long as Z is not going to zero or infinity for any of the values of the fields, then you can perform this, this transformation. And then you can solve the equations of motion where you only have to worry about a potential and not about this extra function uh, Z. So this is, the, uh, this is the idea at this classical level where we're just solving equations of motion. Uh, so now I want to consider uh, some when we're talking about a statistical field theory, so where we're interested in computing averages of quantities, so some quantity which depends now on the fields, which now will be averaged by integrating or summing over the, the, the configuration space, and then the action appears uh, in the Boltzmann weight, so if you like S is the inverse temperature times the Hamiltonian, and uh, if we were doing something like the easing model, then we would have this simple uh, action. So then the normal procedure is to introduce a generating functional for the fields uh, chi. So this means that we couple a field j to the, to, the, to the fields chi, and then we can compute 
the correlation functions. So here I just give a note on my notation. So wherever you see this dot, it implies that, that I perform an integral. And if I have a trace over some two point function, it means that uh, I uh, evaluated at the same value of the field and do the, do the integral. So this is a field theory uh, notation. Um, so this is what we would do in the standard. So then uh, W is the, is, the, is the generating function of connected correlation functions. So then what we want to do is we want to instead uh, think of a generalization of this, where instead of coupling the source to, to the original field uh, chi, we instead uh, couple it to, to a composite operator uh, phi hat, which is again, uh, like in the classical example, this is a deformorphism of the, of the configuration space. So it's like a new, a new coordinate frame that we, uh, we can ch uh, choose to, to, to do our calculations in. So now I should say uh, a few words about the interpretation of the source in this case, because in some, in some applications, we might think of the source as being um, a physical external field. And if we want to do this, then this would give physical meaning to, to, to whatever composite operator we have here, because then obviously this interaction depends on the choice of this, uh, of this composite field. And this isn't really the, the spirit that we want to work in, but, uh, uh, um, but we can also take a different perspective, which is we can also make a change of variables in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the measure so that the J appears now to be to, to couple to, to the same field. But then what will happen is the action itself will transform. So in this way, uh, if we want to think of the J as being coupling to the same field, then we have to think that the action is different. So what this means in the end is that uh, if we are interested in, um, in uh, non-universal quantities, they of course will, 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 will now change because we will be looking at a different source or, or alternatively a different action. But if we're interested in universal quantities like uh, critical scaling exponents, then we are free to do this because once we tune the theory to, to uh, the critical point, we will, we will just find the same scaling exponents independently of, of, uh, of this choice. So, uh, so if we want to just look at universal quantities, then we can, then we can do this. So the, the last point of view is that we can really just think always of this J as purely a technical uh, device, which is kind of the, the framework coming from a high energy physics point of view. And then we would always want to just compute observables at J equals to zero, in which case we, we don't have to assign any physical meaning to this. Uh, so if we would like to do this and still have some sort of source, then this means that we would have to uh, put a source uh, in the in the action, so here H is 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 now some other source, not not not, not the Hamiltonian, some other physical source, let's say, which which always couples to to this. So this is like a price that we would have to pay if we really want to compute uh, non-universal quantities. We would have to put the two sources, essentially one source inside the action, and one source is just this computational device. So with these points in mind, then. Um, uh, what we want to do in, in this spirit is adopt this idea that we can pick these frames however we like, so therefore we will restrict to, to quantities which we can compute uh, independently of, of this frame. Uh, and uh, these will include uh, these, uh, the universal scaling exponents at a critical point, so in the end uh, the application I will give will be to the, to the easing model where where one can really show. So, so this, uh, the, the paper by Wegener back in the 70s really sh showed that you can make these general transformations and, uh, and, you, and the critical exponents uh, at, a, at a critical point, they will be invariant of, the, of which frame you, you pick. So uh, yeah, this is the idea. And uh, so for our purposes, we want, to, we want to develop this into the modern formulation of the renormalization group, which I will uh, explain in a minute. And this is formulated in terms of, um, of a modified form of the one particle uh, irreducible effective action. So the thing that, that generates your, your one particle irreducible uh, correlation functions, which is, which is then obtained by doing a Legendre transformation of, uh, of W. So I should say that I dropped these 
indices that I that I included before, uh, where the, they, they are no longer really necessary. So it's just implied that we will work in this general frame from from now on. Um, so we can do this with under transformation, and then we have a, a generating functional where where phi is now uh, now the mean field. Uh, <clears throat> In presence of this source, and we can give this uh, this uh, this other alternative uh, definition to the effective action, and then we have a, uh, um, expectation values which will depend on the, on the value of the field, uh, which is just a different variable compared to uh, uh, a different variable, which also uh, just as we vary phi, we're, we're in a sense also varying, we're varying j, so it's just a change of, of variables in this sense. Um, and then there is one last ingredient that we will need to include, uh, which uh, its purpose will become apparent later, but, uh, but uh, we, can, we just want to now include also a, an extra source, which is a two-point source, which couples to the fluctuations uh, around the uh, the mean value of the field, so that we will work with an effective action which depends on the phi, and then some uh, two point function k, which I will specify in a moment. So now the idea is that we have the, the this, these generating functionals, and uh, we want to apply this idea that you know that the physics does not depend on which uh, which frame which frame we choose. So the natural thing to to ask then is how these how these uh, functionals transform under these transformations. So what we can do is we can take uh, the original frame and then we, we add to it uh, an infinitesimal uh, part, which is Xi, so this is the, an infinitesimal uh, uh, frame transformation. And then you can see this is how these different uh, generating functionals will transform. So note that the W and gamma, they transform in, in quite simple ways just with this one extra term. So what happens, of course, when you do these transformations is that they, they get then re-expressed in the expectation value of, of, of Xi. So in the case of W, you see that uh, the transformation just gives you a term which is uh, always linear in J. And for gamma, it's, uh, it's a term which is proportional to the, to the first functional derivative of, uh, of gamma times, times the, this function Xi. And uh, then if we have this, uh, this extra source though, we get this more complicated term here where you have uh, an actual loop correction. So since you have a trace, if you go to momentum space, this is a, this is a loop, a loop term, a one loop term, and it involves this, this, uh, this uh, modified propagator of, of the theory. So this is a more complicated uh, transformation. And this is the one that we'll be interested in when we, when we, uh, when we look at the, the non-perturbative renormalization group uh, equations. Um, so then, uh, now I can finally come to this word uh, essential, which is in my title. So the point is that these correlation functions, they will depend on, on the different uh, coupling constants that we have. And these coupling constants, we can then, uh, they fall into two classes. So if we think of uh, when we compute quantities that they should always be invariant under these frame transformations, so uh, these critical exponents, then um, we should have couplings which actually enter these physical uh, quantities. On the other hand, if we can, if, if we are allowed to make these frame transformations, the, the inessential couplings are those that where, where we vary the, the, the generating functional respect to the inessential coupling omega, this can be expressed exactly as one of these frame transformations for some for some xi. So these are the coupling constants which ultimately we want to to get rid of because they won't uh, they won't actually enter into the physical uh, quantities that we're interested in. So this is the idea, and now uh, now I want to talk about the the non-perturbative renormalization group and how we how it incorporates this idea. So uh, this idea is, as I explained in the uh, in the introduction, so it's uh, it's a method which you can use in statistical or quantum field theories to uh, to actually obtain correlation functions. And the key idea is that what you want to do is not uh, average over all fluctuations at once, but first of all, what you do is you introduce a cutoff scale, and then 
so the cutoff scale is uh, k, which is a momentum scale. So then you you can first average over the the small distance or the large momentum fluctuations, and then you get a new description uh, where you now just have the remaining uh, long wavelength. Uh, fluctuations to to integrate out so you get a new description in terms of a new action which now depends on on these new coupling constants and then ultimately what we can do is we can take this scale all the way to zero and then we've uh, then we've included all the fluctuations so if you like then we have performed uh, the integral in the in the functional integral uh, so and then we at the end of the the rg flow so when we take k all the way to zero then we obtain the correlation functions, which is ultimately what you, what you want. Um, so the modern formulation of this idea, so this idea was first introduced by, by Wilson in the 70s, and then there was work by Polchinski in the 80s, and then since the 90s, the work of Christoph Wetherick and Tim Morris and others have really turned this into now an industry where you can really use this to in all these different areas of physics. And most applications, they, they, are, uh, they are based on what's called the effective average action. So uh, the idea of this effective average action is that uh, it depends on the cutoff scale k. And when we take this k towards the ultraviolet uh, cutoff scale, then this action should, uh, should approach then the microscopic ac action. Uh, or, the, or the Hamiltonian, if you like, of, of your system. So some simple... Uh, simple theory which is, describes your microscopic degrees of freedom. On the other hand, then when you take uh, the other limit, when you take k all the way to zero, then this, this, uh, this functional should then actually be just the one pi effective action so that you can obtain all your correlation functions once you've integrated out all the modes. So then in a picture, this is the idea. So you, 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 you can think of this action, if you think of all the coupling constants that it can depend on, it's then uh, a different actions and then just different points in theory space where these are all the coupling constants that appear in the action. And you start at some point where the, the action is the microscopic one and then you flow taking K down towards zero. And then at the end of the flow, you will reach uh, the full effective action where you can obtain your correlation functions. And then these different lines represent the fact that you can do this in, in different manners. So there are different reg regulators you can introduce and different uh, other things that you can do uh, to, to construct different uh, RG flows. But all of them start from the same microscopic and action and then should end uh, in, with the full effective action at the end. Uh, so within the formalism that, that I introduced, what you do is you take this two-point source and you, 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 you make it, you turn it into an infrared regulator. So then in position space, it, it has this form. And if you transform into momentum space, it depends on this kernel, which depends on the ratio of the momentum divided by K squared. And then the point is this kernel, when you take the momentum very large, uh, it should vanish so that you're, you're integrating out the the large momentum modes unsuppressed. And when you take uh, the limit uh, that P goes to zero, then it should either go to a finite limit or it should diverge so that you're already suppressing the low energy modes. So then you have this, uh, this expression for the effective average action. And then what's happening when you take K towards lambda and lambda is, we, we assume here lambda is essentially infinity. What happens then is this essentially becomes a delta function in the path integral. And then when you evaluate the, the, the delta function, this gives you uh, the limit that this should then go back to the microscopic action. <clears throat> um, so then this is the idea. And as I said, this, this function R here, you can choose it in many ways to have as long as it has the appropriate limit. So here I just give some different, uh, different functions that you can choose so you can have uh, you can have smooth ones, which involves ex exponentials and where they might have some finite limits. You can also have ones where uh, the, the, it depends on the theta function. So it's zero until this uh, ratio becomes one and then, and then the regulator turns on. And you can also have power law type regulators which, which diverge when the momentum goes to zero. And at the exact level, all the physical quantities are independent of wh which choice you make because this is just different ways to do your core straining, if you like. Um, but obviously, when you make approximations, uh, 
then this choice of the regulator becomes important. And this is where then you have the technical problem of trying to find, okay, you make some approximation, you're expanding somehow, and uh, for different regulators, this expansion can be, uh, the, the, the radius of convergence of this expansion could be, could be zero, it could be finite, and you have to choose a good regulator to actually get uh, good physical results. So this is, a, this is the technical, uh, technical thing you have to do when, when you use this, this method. Um, so in terms of uh, what I'm calling the standard scheme, so what is generally done, uh, the, the, the field that, that we're using, as I said before, what it is is just, uh, it's related to, the, to, to the, the field chi just by a simple rescaling. So there is just this simple relationship between the two fields. And then uh, when you take uh, a k derivative of uh, this expression, then to get how, how this action depends on k, then you end up with this equation, which is called uh, the vetheric morris equation. And here with this anomalous dimension included. So the anomalous dimension is then related to the derivative of this uh, wave function renormalization, which is then just a single inessential coupling in, in, this, in this formulation. And you can see that the terms proportional to eta here, they have the form of this, uh, this frame transformation where, where the xi is just linear in the field. So it's minus one half times the eta, which is the, the anomalous dimension of the field. And this is the, the standard uh, the standard schemes of the standard setup, which is which is done, and and the purpose of introducing this eta is that now the action, when expressed in terms of phi instead of in terms of chi, it will it won't depend on the wave function renormalization. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So I could I could re-express it in terms of mean value of chi, and then I would reintroduce this dependence on z. So you see by working with phi, I'm just removing the, the independence of Z. But I still have the freedom now to say, well, exactly what is Z, right? So I have the freedom to, to basically choose which is which coupling I'm freezing. And, and this is just uh, the, what's, what's known as setting different renormalization conditions. So what is uh, typically done, let's say, is that I can expand my action in, in derivatives, and then I will get this term with two derivatives, and then one can choose a specific value of the field, for example, where the field vanishes, or maybe where the field is at the minimum of this potential. And then I can say that this function xi is just one at uh, that scale. And then the point is that I will, under this condition, I will then solve this equation. And since now I've made this one condition, th th this means that then I'll have one, one equation which, which then determines now uh, eta. So, so, so I'm basically, trading the dependence on, on this one inessential coupling. And now I just will get eta, but it will, eta will not depend now on Z itself, but eta will just be a function of all the other coupling constants. So uh, this is the idea. And uh, in this simple uh, setup, you can actually see that when you arrive to a fixed point of the renormalization group, this eta of K will actually correspond exactly to the, the, the critical exponent eta, which, which is why, why it's uh, given given the, the same uh, name. Um, so yeah, this is the idea within the standard scheme. And so then uh, how do you actually solve these equations? So there are many different approximation schemes that you can choose, but I will, I will talk about the derivative expansion since it's the one which is we know the most about and it has shown good uh, convergence uh, properties. So the idea is that you, expand the action in, in derivatives. So you, you start with a simple potential, then you have a term with two derivatives, and then you have terms with four derivatives, and then you can go on in this expansion, and you will have then more and more functions of the field, which uh, here we're not expanding in the field, we're just expanding in the derivatives. So then what this amounts to, once you plug this all into, this, into the equation and expand, also the trace in the same way is you will then get a set of coupled uh, differential equations for each of these these functions and then okay so practically what one has to do then is pick some some order to truncate this expansion and then just solve uh, 
solve for a finite number of these uh, coupled differential equations. And then, of course, you can you can increase the order. So where well, S here is the order of the truncation. And then and then what you should find is that if, if this is going to converge, is that physical quantities should hopefully converge towards their their uh, their physical values. So uh, this is the idea in the standard scheme. So now I want to discuss what our idea is for this. Uh, um, essential scheme. So the point now is that we take this field uh, phi hat, which now is a function of k, to be a completely general, uh, suitably local function of, of the field chi. And then we derive this equation. And what ha happens is it has a, a similar form. But now this, uh, this term that was previously just uh, minus phi times eta is now replaced by f, which is the expectation value. Uh, sorry, this should, this should not be a curly bracket, but uh, but an angular bracket. So this is this is the expectation value of the derivative of this 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 uh, this field. So now we have the freedom to to choose uh, this guy, uh, this f, and if we make a derivative expansion, then we can uh, uh, expand in derivatives. Uh, here my notation is also uh, a bit wrong. This this is just the Laplacian, and these are just the well, these are the gradients of, of the field. Um, so the point is that then we can expand uh, f uh, just like we expanded the action also in, in the number of derivatives. So the first time there will be no derivatives, and then we will get terms with two derivatives and, and higher. So, so, so these, these are the two derivative terms, so then this should be order four here. Uh, so then the point is that just like uh, before, we can now choose renormalization conditions to remove the inessential couplings, but now what we can do is really remove all of these inessential couplings, order by order in, in this uh, derivative expansion. So whereas in the standard scheme, we were just removing a single coupling, now we will, we will attempt to remove all of these inessential couplings so that uh, we just get a, a flow for just these essential couplings. Uh, so in principle, there are many different renormalization conditions that one could attempt to, to, to impose. So there's not a, a unique way that this can be done. So pragmatically, uh, well, what we can think about is in some sense that we have this, uh, we have this, this uh, frame invariance or reparameterization invariance, and we can think of the renormalization condition in an analogy to uh, a gauge fixing condition in, in a gauge field, in a gauge theory. So this, this just like when we pick a gauge fixing condition, we try to reduce the redundancy introduced by the gauge invariance here, we're reducing the, we're removing the redundancy with respect to the, the frame invariance. So we can think of different conditions as different gauge fixing conditions. And uh, the simplest thing we can do is we can look for a free fixed point. So uh, where we have a Gaussian model. So where the action is just given by this, this simple two derivative term. And then we can find, well, what are the inessential couplings really around this, this point? And then we choose the renormalization group equation so that at least around the free fixed point, we remove all the, uh, the inessential couplings. And then as we flow, we, 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 this, this, uh, this will then uh, give us a way to close the equations. So if we do this, this means that apart from this term in the action, which will get normalized with the one half, we then remove any terms uh, of this form where now uh, this capital uh, phi can be any uh, operator which is suitably uh, local in the fields. So all of these terms will then not appear in the, in the ansatz for the, for the effective action. And then we solve the effective action, we solve, sorry, the flow equation under this, uh, this renormalization condition, and then this will determine all these functions f and g as functions of the remaining uh, coupling constants, just like previously what happened is we would just get the equations just for, for the single eta. Now we have all the eta is replaced by this functional expression for given by f. So uh, this is the idea, and then we can just see how this idea works where we make the, the, the order two approximation in this derivative expansion. So in the standard scheme, 
this would mean that the action has this form where we have this function zeta, which is playing the same role as Z in, our, uh, in this uh, example I gave in the classical field theory. And in the standard scheme, we can just fix one of the couplings in Z. So we can just pick a value of the field, for example, the field equals to zero and set this guy to one. But other than this constraint, we have to solve the flow equation to, to, find, to find zeta. But what happens in the essential scheme is that we can, oops, we can actually set the entire function zeta uh, uh, to one. So th this means that we can remove this entire function. And at this uh, level of approximation, this means that this, this f is just expressed as just a function of the field, so without any, any derivatives. So then if you look at the, at the structure of this equation, you see that it's nonlinear in the action because it, here you have the, the second functional derivative of, of the action in, in, this, uh, in this propagator. So if it depends on zeta, as in the, the standard scheme, then it depends nonlinearly on, on zeta. Uh, whereas uh, what we're doing then is we're trading this for a dependence on the function f, but the equation is linear in f. So this, this automatically makes much, things much, much simpler. So you will actually have the same, uh, the same number of equations, but you will have this linear dependence on, on f rather than this nonlinear dependence on zeta, which really makes everything uh, much, much simpler when you're doing, doing these, these calculations because essentially because of this propagator that you get by taking two functional derivatives of this uh, action and then inverting is going to be much uh, simpler. So this is really a, a practical idea. You see, we, we've introduced this, 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 this uh, quite a lot of this machinery, but in the end, the point is that the equations that we actually solve, they will be simpler once, once, we, have, once we have done this. So, uh, then I can turn to an application of this. Uh, so this is uh, what we've done to, to test this, this formalism is we've gone to the 3D easing model since this is uh, like the benchmark where we can really compare uh, how well uh, this, uh, this new scheme compares to, to, to other schemes. So in particular, we look, uh, we study the Wilson Fisher fixed point in, 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 in three dimensions. So when you look for fixed points, what you want to do is you want to actually remove the scale K because you want to look at something where you have scale invariance. So this means that you, you work in uh, dimensionless variables. So you, you just essentially um, <clears throat> rescale everything by factors of, of K and then look, look in, this form, in this formulation, in a dimensionless uh, formulation where, where uh, fixed points, where, where the dimensionless variables become in, independent of of K and uh, okay, for this case, we just use this uh, simple regulator. And then when we look for, for the fixed points, then we get these, these, uh, these uh, differential equations. Uh, so here B is a number which actually you can, you can just set to one if you like. Yeah. It's, uh, it just depends exactly how you do this, this, uh, this rescaling. So, so it, you can think of it as one here. So then we get these differential equations uh, for these two, two functions. And as you can see, they are linear in, in, in F, which is the, the dimensionless uh, version of the capital F. And these equations, okay, I'm not going to show you the ones in the standard scheme, but they are much more, much more complicated than these ones. You get two equations, but they're, they're, they are more complicated. So thanks to this uh, form of the regulator, you see that these just depend on, on rational functions. Whereas uh, for the same regulator in the standard scheme, you, you, you don't get such just rational functions of, of, of the, the derivatives of, of F and, uh, and V. So this means that once we arrive at these equations, actually finding the, the fixed point solution is much uh, simpler within this scheme. So what we are then interested, if we're looking at the, the 3D easing model, so now we've gone to three dimensions, uh, so we also impose this Z2 symmetry for the, the potential. And then what we do is we solve these equations looking for solutions where uh, the, the solution should be valid for all values of the field. So from, from minus infinity to plus infinity. And once you do this, you can find that there are only finite, there are only a finite number of solutions. So this basically picks what your, your initial conditions for these differential equations need to be. 
So the only fixed points that you find are the, the trivial uh, free fixed point where the potential is just uh, constant. And then you also find the interacting uh, Wilson Fisher fixed point. So this story is the same in, in, in the standard scheme where you would be solving for, for V and for zeta, but these equations are much simpler to, to, to solve. So practically it's much easier. So you can do this, and then this is the form of the, the, the dimensionless potential. So you, you see it has this Mexican hat uh, form, which, uh, which is the, the form you expect for the, for the, uh, for the, for the, um, for the Wilson Fisher fixed point in, in three dimensions. So this allows you to find the, uh, the fixed point, and then to find the critical exponents, what you do is you perturb uh, the solution, so you look at the linearized flow around the solution, and then you can express this uh, linearized flow, uh, flow as, uh, uh, as a sum of terms which are then eigen perturbations, so, so you make a separation of variables, so you have all the k-dependence in this factor, where, where, where then theta will be the critical exponent, and then you have all the phi dependence in this psi of phi. And one can show when you uh, when you look at these uh, these equations that uh, that that uh, these these equations are quantized so that they're that this spectrum is not a continuous spectrum but a, uh, so you, the values are not I think there is a problem with the, on the spectrum uh, the uh, Kevin. Uh, there was a problem with the connection, some interaction. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. You could repeat the last uh, few sentences. Okay, I go back. Uh, yeah, so I just go back to this slide. So, um, so the point is after solving the, the fixed point equation, which, which means that uh, in dimensionless variables, there is no K dependent. Then you look for a perturbation of the fixed point, and this is how you can extract the, the critical scaling exponents. Um, <clears throat> So uh, yeah, this is done by, 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 by then making a separation of, of, of variables so that the K dependence just uh, comes in this prefactor where, where theta will be the critical, the universal critical exponent and all the phi dependence is in this psi. And you can show uh, both in the standard scheme and in this, in this, uh, in this essential scheme that, that, that this spectrum is quantized, which is what you expect because you just expect some discrete uh, values for these critical exponents. Um, so then one can so solve these linearized uh, equations and uh, so to find the critical exponent new you look at the, the, the relevant uh, exponent which is the one where this exponent is positive and there is just one of these and then you can identify the inverse of this with, with the scaling exponent new. To find the, the scaling exponent eta uh, this will be related since it's related to the scaling of just uh, of, of the operator phi hat, if you like, then this turns into an odd, an odd perturbation. So here you have to make a perturbation with an, with a, with an odd function of the field to, to extract this, uh, this critical exponent. Uh, so then there is a critical exponent, which is, which, which there is a scaling relation, which, which, uh, which allows you to then identify the value of eta. So I should say at this point that this is this uh, calculation of eta is actually more complicated in, in our formulation. So this is the one drawback, and this is related to the fact that, uh, as I was saying, so you can think of eta as being uh, related to a perturbation which is just uh, which is just chi. So in the standard formulation, you can just read this off from the value of eta at the fixed point. But in our uh, essential one, you actually the the uh, the expression for the for this psi. So in the standard scheme, the psi would just be phi. But for us, in in the essential scheme, it will now be some complicated odd function of the field. And you can find this perturbation, and then you can compute uh, the value of of eta. So then these are the values of nu and eta which uh, we obtain. And uh, so it makes sense for us then to compare, well, what would we get if we did the standard scheme? So then there, is the, there, there has been the, these papers that looked into this in 2003. And you can see that our, our results are, are very comparable. Actually, we get the same value of eta, but our value of uh, 
new is slightly different. And if we compare to the, the best results, which come from the conformal bootstrap, our value for, uh, for uh, new is uh, slightly better. So I should say here that uh, all we've done here is use one regulator so far, and we haven't studied the dependence on the regulator. Whereas these ones, they have, uh, what these ones have been um, obtained by looking for the, uh, scanning the space of regulators, so just introducing one parameter and then and then looking at the dependence of this one parameter, and then finding the point where the, the sensitivity to the critical exponent is minimized, so looking for a minimum of these quantities. So this is known as the principle of minimum sensitivity, and it's something that, in a sense, you're obliged to do, so, because for most regulators, uh, the, the derivative expansion will not converge well, so you have to find the one which is picked out by this principle of minimum sensitivity. So we haven't yet uh, done, done, uh, obtained uh, values which uh, have done this, but these values just for this single regulator are also already in good, uh, uh, good agreement with these ones. So, so, uh, <coughs> so this this really gives us uh, uh, gives us the indication that our method uh, is not only simpler but also give, will, in the end it seems seems to converge in a similar fashion to the to the standard scheme. Um, so then we can, of course, then increase S to go to higher orders in the derivative expansion, and then we will get uh, more complicated equations. So, but what's going to happen is that each, at each order in this expansion, uh, always our uh, equations in the essential scheme will be simpler than those in the, uh, in the standard scheme, because we have now the power to remove all uh, these different terms. So. I just go back. So we will remove all terms which which involve this uh, essentially the 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 equation of motion for this free free theory. So once you've done this uh, at different orders, then so for example at fourth order, then you just get one new new function of the field. Um, then this table where we compare what happens at the standard scheme. So in the standard scheme, there are five functions of the of, of, of the field uh, at the fourth order, whereas for us in the essential scheme, there will only be two. And then this uh, repeats at, at higher orders. So once you go to the sixth order, which is the highest order that is currently being investigated, there are 13 of these uh, 13 uh, couple differential equations. So you can imagine that it's very complicated. So we will also get 13 equations, but, but we will get them such that uh, they only have linear dependence on, on, on the apps. So the non-linear dependence will only then be on, on five of these, these potentials at order six. So you can see that at each order in this expansion, we will get, a, we will get simpler equations to solve, which, which hopefully means that uh, practically one can actually go to higher orders uh, uh, with less effort, let's say. So really it's then a practical advantage to, to use this uh, essential scheme over the standard scheme. <clears throat> so, uh, so then I can just uh, make my uh, conclusions. So I've been giving a, well, a quite biased and uh, personal introduction to this non-perturbative renormalization group, uh, sort of introducing not only the, the method, but what I think is, is perhaps uh, an even better scheme to use. And uh, so this takes advantage of that we can perform these general reparameterizations or these frame transformations as I have called them. And then one can apply not just a single renormalization condition to remove one coupling, but to actually remove all of these inessential couplings. And uh, this is really just a practical idea. So it's just there to, to reduce the com complexity of the calculation so that one can actually uh, access physical quantities with, with less effort. So this is really just the, the simple idea. And the point here is that, okay, although I've just discuss, discussed uh, a single scalar field is that really the, the, these ideas, so this essential scheme can be adapted to all the different other applications of the RG. So for example, to, to applications in ultra cold atoms, to QC, QCD, to quantum gravity, and to many other, many other things. So hopefully th this idea can be really uh, universally applied to make this uh, method um, more useful and uh, to allow us to obtain quantities uh, more easily. So this is the message. So uh, thank you very much uh, for
for listening to my talk. Thank you, Kevin, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, any questions? We have, uh, again, plenty of time for our questions. Uh, I actually have one. So I am a, I never actually worked in renormalization normalization group from the analytical point of view. But the first thing that I remember when I was taught back in university was that one of the pretty much one of the first requirements that you have in your uh, in your renormalization group theory is they usually restrict yourself to short range interactions. Um, and then if things are long range, the, the theory might work, but maybe there are some corrections, some things to take care of, and the things is, is actually controversial as far as I understand. Does your approach change anything to this regard? So can long range interactions be integrated naturally into the thing and does it work just fine out of the box? Mm. So uh, I think there is no reason why in this exact uh, formulation, uh, uh, the non-perturbative formulation, that that you that you that you can't that you can't do this because the idea always is that the long the long range uh, interactions these are going to be integrated out last. So in a sense, what you're doing is always removing uh, the short range interactions. So certainly this this is the uh, the idea and therefore if there are long range interactions, uh, yeah, so it, it, it might be more difficult. Uh, but I think that, uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, you would have to look at the specific, specific example and obviously like any tool, there are certain things that it can, it can be more useful to do and um, uh, certain, uh, certain problems there can be less useful. So what I should also say is that where you have uh, points where maybe your fundamental degrees of freedom at some point, at some scale, become uh, not the, the relevant ones, uh, you can also use these sort of frame transformations to, to describe uh, transitions to, to, to other physical degrees of freedom. So for example, you can use it to, to describe like those bosonization and things like this. Uh, so there are also maybe more physically motivated ways to, to use this freedom to, to, to fix. So for me, I'm just introducing it in a very practical way to, to do this, but maybe for, for problems with long range interactions, there is some more, uh, more physical way of choosing this F, which you could, uh, which you could do, which would, which would aid this. So I think that this is a, a strong possibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pierre? So, I also have a question and more for the, this, uh, the application of this, uh, of this essential renormalization to QCD, as it was mentioned uh, mm -hmm. in, your, in your conclusion. So, how would this uh, renormalization scheme compare to some other, let's say, partial um, summation renormalization scheme that has the one that gives the Schringer Dyson equation and, and that. I mean, would you say that this, uh, renormaliza this renormalization scheme that you present is more powerful in the sense that it is more non perturbative, but it is more difficult to apply to a more generic problem, or is this uh, more complicated? Uh, so uh, the functional renormalization group is already applied uh, to, to QCD, and I would say that uh, compared to the Schunger Dyson, uh, it's uh, equally non-perturbative because they're both uh, okay. they're both uh, based on these um, exact equations. So Schunger Dyson equations or, or these functional renormalization group equations, they're both exact identities. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, in the in the case of, of QCD in the applications that, that, that are done by in, in Heidelberg, which is where I was uh, before, they would uh, they would take this this F to typically they would take this this F uh, to to be of this form where where uh, we talk about the, the standard scheme, but they will allow this eta to depend on the momentum. So th this makes sure that the the the, the gluon propagator 
essentially always just just depends on p squared and doesn't the the the, mm -hmm. the glow on propagator doesn't doesn't become non-trivial. So you always get rid of the non-trivial uh, momentum dependence of the of the of the of the trivial uh, propagator. Okay. So uh, this idea could uh, is then incorporated in this trivial way, uh, more, well, non-trivial, but uh, but but in in this approach, we really have the the power to 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 include uh, uh, more nonlinear transformations of the field, and I think that this would then uh, I, I really hope that this can be applied to to QCD. So. For myself personally, I'm more working in gravity, and there, I, uh, which is uh, also a gauge theory, so it's quite similar to QCD. So there, I know already that uh, we can apply this idea. So we've already started doing this, and there are there are certainly certain terms in in in, in the flow equation which then you you can again uh, get rid of. So the same thing will happen in QCD. So essentially, any any term which is uh, more or less it's any term that appears in QCD proportional to the equations of motion, then you can remove the, these terms. So, uh, so yeah, I think that they can really be, be applied there as well. Uh, of course, it's also possible, I think, to incorporate the same idea into the Dyson-Schwinger equations. It will just appear in a, in a slightly different way. So, so I think that uh, wherever you are doing some sort of renormalization, you can, you can always choose this more general approach and therefore hopefully simplify your equations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I have uh, one question uh, again relevant to what Pierre asked. Um, how how does this machinery compare can be compared with the uh, so-called two particle irreducible effective action method? Which my understanding is that they are one has a, a systematic expansion in uh, in loops, which uh, makes the equations um, more and more complicated. One starts with the the so-called cactus diagram, which is the simpler the simplest form of the the simplest case that can be solved relatively easily uh, and uh, amount accounts for uh, you know corrections of the mm -hmm. mass mass shifts etc like in hartley fog then uh, one can numerically solve the next leading order uh, corrections coming from sunset type diagrams and uh, i wonder if um, if, if uh, this approach corresponds to some simplification or some some special uh, so broadly speaking uh, so I've introduced the the derivative expansion uh, which is used uh, mostly in the scalar fields so in in applications to QCD what is used is a, is a, is a, is, a, is another expansion where what you do is you expand uh, only in the fields, but you keep all the momentum. So, so you do the opposite of what is done here. What I do here is that I uh, keep all the field dependence, but I expand, uh, if you like, in the momentum or the derivatives. Hmm. So in QCD, what they're usually doing is uh, they're, they're, they're instead doing a, a vertex expansion. So they're expanding in the, in the field amplitudes. And because of the structure of the equations, uh, because there is two derivatives here, this means that uh, the the endpoint function will always depend on the n plus two point function so then you have to of course truncate the system exactly as you must truncate this uh, derivative expansion but uh, so you can look into this review which i uh, i gave in the in the uh, in the in the introduction and into the work of uh, the group in heidelberg so jan pavlovsky's group and this is where they're really using the the, the, these flow equations to study uh, QCD, but I think they're they 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 are then doing this uh, this uh, non perturbative approximation, and then they can actually study things like con confinement uh, using using the, this flow equation where they are doing this this vertex expansion. This, this is the approximation scheme which the, which they are mostly mostly using. Uh, so I hope this this at least uh, answers your question, or maybe you can look into into these papers to understand uh, exactly how this lines up with the the two pi uh, two pi effective action. Uh, 
I think there is also a recent paper where they are also trying to incorporate this 2PI uh, effective action into the functional renormalization group. So there, I think maybe they are trying to combine uh, these methods. So this paper was uh, by Jan Podlowski and, uh, and collaborators came out a few, a few weeks ago uh, talking about how to incorporate this 2PI and uh, they are making at least some 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 statements that this can really improve the the approximations when you do this. So, mm -hmm. so there are generalizations of these equations where where you where you can work with a two pi effective action instead of a one pi one. Uh -huh. uh, thanks. And one more question. Uh, again, from the two two pi uh, approach, I, I I know that um, uh, there are generalizations extensions of the machinery that apply to non-equilibrium cases, like when I start with uh, some initial state and I want to, to do the dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, how much uh, does this, uh, your approach rely on, you know, on, on the specific problem of, uh, here you want to calculate the ground state properties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, when you want to include, uh, time dependence, let's say, then then typically what you have to do is, uh, well, I think that one approach uh, used in, uh, is, is to, 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 to do some analytical uh, wick rotation to, to be able to describe some time dependence so, so to, to work uh, out of uh, equilibrium. So I am not an expert on these techniques, but uh, again, in this review, you can, you can, uh, you can see that uh, there is some, there is some work in this direction. So, so uh, because uh, of the, this regulator, essentially, if it has the, if it also, if it isn't uh, positive, then you will get uh, an infrared uh, divergence here. So you can see from the structure of the equation that this R is becoming an, an infrared uh, regulator here. So if you try to have uh, a time derivative, then then typically you either have to break the the symmetry, or you. Uh, or you have to do some analytical uh, continuation. So I think that these are the two methods which is used uh, when you are studying uh, time dependence. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I think there are no more questions. Uh, so let's uh, thank Kevin again. Uh, and I don't know if there is any announcement. Uh... So no particular announcement, except that uh, the next and last session will start at 1.30 today.